It is embedded in the landscape. You can hear it in the wind. The ghosts of the past resonate today. Every place has a story, a history all its own. But the story often dies with the people who once lived there. Old photographs lose their meaning, and all that is left is the land. It's anyone's guess what happened there, or who lived and died there. But there is more to this land than meets the eye. Wessington Plantation lies 25 miles outside the bright lights of Nashville, Tennessee. For more than 195 years, the mansion and barn have stood, sentinels to a world that no longer exists. Miraculously, the plantation's records survived the Civil War and the 150 years that followed a treasure trove of detailed accounts, letters, and photographs reveal the life and work of the people who lived here. And stories that were passed down to children and grandchildren have been recorded and saved. My great-grandma Sarah would gather up all of us grandchildren and great-grandchildren and tell us about slavery times. Wessington is not fiction. This was a real plantation with a unique history that tells the story of both owner and slave. In 1860, Wessington was one of the largest plantations in the state of Tennessee and an economic powerhouse of the Old South. The head of this empire was George A. Washington, the only son of Joseph Washington. He inherited Wessington at the age of 32. In a span of 15 years, George had expanded Wessington into the largest tobacco producer in the country. I was told by an old cotton man in New Orleans when I went there as a young woman that when the word would go out that Washington's crops were in, everything and everybody rushed to the sales, knowing the goods were the best. The Wessington records reveal the cost of a pound of tobacco the cost of an acre of land, and the price of a slave. They are numbers that tell the story of economic success, human heartache, and the daily operations of a plantation. 13,000. That's the number of acres the Washingtons owned in 1860. Their main cash crop was tobacco, and that year they sold 250,000 pounds. At that time, the Washington lands, personal property, slaves, and livestock were valued at $550,000, placing them among the wealthiest families in the state. But there is a human story behind these numbers. Tobacco cultivation was backbreaking work, from planting, tending, to harvesting the leaves, and at the heart of the operation were slaves. Unlike wage workers, Slaves could never quit and would remain enslaved for life. The first slaves at Wessington traveled 800 miles from Virginia to Tennessee. George A. Washington's daddy brought their ancestors to Tennessee with them from Virginia. Some of them walking every step of the way. Those slaves really had it hard back then. When the Washington slaves arrived to the rolling hills of Tennessee, they worked long hours to clear the land and build the Wessington Mansion. The walls are four to five bricks thick, and it took four years to complete the construction. I remember my great-grandma Sarah telling us about building the big house at Washington. 
She said her and the other slaves would have to carry clay from down there where the creek is up to where the big house is now, and the other slave men made bricks to build that house. By 1860, Wessington Plantation was a huge operation with a labor force of 274 slaves. As the slaves described it, they worked from can't see to can't see. It would be so dark when they went to the fields you couldn't see and so dark when they finished you couldn't see. Wasn't no calling out sick either. There were other jobs to do besides the production of tobacco. Slaves ran a huge pork operation, distilled whiskey, and harvested lumber. They worked as blacksmiths and carpenters, fed livestock, mended fences, and repaired everything from torn clothes to slave cabins. The Wessington slave women worked as hard as the men. They cooked cleaned, and tended the garden. They also churned butter and manufactured starch, soap, and candles. No matter what work was required of them, all the slaves lived under the threat of punishment. Records show that between 1841 and 1863, at least 21 slaves, including five women, were whipped for various offenses, such as running away, losing or damaging tools, or not working hard enough. Slave owners tempered brutality and the fear of its use with other methods and incentives. The Wessington slaves had Saturday afternoon and all day Sunday off, and if a slave was required to work on those days, they were paid for working. The Washingtons, with two exceptions, didn't sell their slaves. With families intact, the Wessington slaves became a tight-knit community. But even with these conditions, some Wessington slaves tried to escape bondage. Two slaves that made multiple attempts at running away were Davy White and one known only as Henry. They were the only two slaves the Washingtons ever sold. The highest offer I have had for Henry since I've been here is $800 on six months credit and the purchaser refused to take him because I would not guarantee him against running away. I shall keep him here until I leave and if I cannot sell him, I'll take him with me to Nashville and sell him at auction, which in my opinion is the best thing you can do with yours. The correspondences and accounts of George A. Washington describe a complex relationship between slave and owner. Some slaves were thought of as extended members of his family. George was raised by enslaved caregivers, and slaves were his childhood playmates. Yet underneath these human relationships was always a contradiction, the brutal fact that some people were forcibly being enslaved by others a denial of the very concept of liberty that had been promised by the founders of the nation. We can only wonder how each of the Washingtons reconciled this fact. The Wessington Plantation was owned by the Washington family up until 1983. Today, the search to understand and honor the enslaved people who lived and worked here continues as does the relationship between the white and black Wessington families. In 1994, the descendants of both families worked together to erect a monument on the site of unmarked graves in the slave cemetery. And descendants are now working together to discover the number and placement of graves in that cemetery. Ground penetrating radar is being used to map the burials. Experts believe that up to 200 graves may be identified. 
The story of Wessington Plantation puts names and faces to the people who powered the economic success of antebellum Tennessee. The faceless become real and the land speaks.